There we go. Hey, good evening. Glad to see everyone here this evening. If you would, get a songbook, please. And turn your songbook to 968. 968. Nice crowd here tonight. Glad to see everybody. 968. <clears throat> oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies, and they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a home where my friends have gone. Oh, they tell me of that land far away. Where the tree of life in eternal blooms Sheds its fragrance through the unclouded day Oh, the land of cloudless day Oh, the land of an unclouded sky Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, they tell me that he smiles on his children there, and his smile drives their sorrows away. And they tell me that no tears ever come again in that lovely land of unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of an unclouded sky. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Good evening. We're glad you're here. Even the song was of a cloudless day. We got storms coming tonight, so be aware. Just be aware. Uh, tornado watch is already out in central Oklahoma, so always, always just be aware. On our prayer list, uh, there's so many, there's so many um, that we need to look at, and we'll try to go through them all, then we'll pray. Um, in Honduras, if you uh, do Facebook, Check out the School of Hope, because that, that's a big part of, of what we do with our missions. And you get to see all, all of those kids, um, the, the children who are the kids of the dump. And uh, they're making it. They're, they're having a life, and they're getting the gospel. So check that out. Um, we have Karen Vaughn and Bobby Vaughn, Stan Beck, John Cook, Luana Long, Jeff Yonk. Jamie Smith, Susan Buff, Kenny Bethune, Wanda Benson, and others are battling cancer. John has a surgery tomorrow. Remember John. Uh, Randy Lipska, and that's Lori Lipska's husband. Joyce Hightower, her son-in-law. Wanda Dobson. I meant Dobson, okay? <laughs> Have you been to the doctor lately? <laughs> Wanda Dobson. Okay, and Randy Lipska. And, and what Joyce was telling me that this melanoma had a big knot and it's it's really going to be a hard, hard thing on him. They're going to kind of go from here down and it's might paralyze his jaw and things. So it, it's not good. So remember, I don't know if they've got that scheduled. It's not scheduled yet, but... Pray for them. Uh, Rita Garvin has her surgery on Friday. Ray Brewer, Steve here. He, is, he's doing great. Had a good surgery. David Warren, he come out okay from his, um, he's home, okay? Uh, also remembering uh, Sandra Screws. That's Rainer Screws' wife. Uh, she had the stroke, 
and uh, it's just not getting back to normal. And then, uh, so just remember her, Juanita Williams, that's Nancy's mom, but it's also Geneva's sister and Janelle Beaver's sister. Uh, she's still in ICU. Uh, she's been having some problems with her heart and um, uh, also pneumonia and um, urinary tract infection. So she's got a lot going on in her dad's is um, battling COVID and just the fear of getting pneumonia and, and all of that that goes with it. Uh, Galen Tribby, uh, prayer for him for his esophagus. Uh, still Stanley Elms. We any updates on Stan? Because I know that his back was in pain. I think he had a doctor's appointment this week. May May first, and then that was just a lot of pain for him. Um, Eddie Bowman, uh, Grace. What about Eddie? Is Gracie here? Okay, so Tommy has pneumonia. Eddie has the fractured vertebrae. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Also, uh, Rachel Long had her surgery, and Billy Bates. Mike says she's doing is. Like in about a month, they're going to take the baby. As of now, she's everybody. The baby's okay. She's real pregnant looking. That's all I know. Real pregnant looking. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm going to let people ask you what that means. Okay, yes, <laughs> Mike, you know what it means. No. Okay. <laughs> Oh, really? Kenny Bethune had to go to the emergency room. Okay. Okay. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, we know that so many is recovering. Anthony Machota. Anthony, he's, he's getting around on a walk. He's got a cane and he's getting around. Doctor gave him a good report. So, yeah. But, I mean, why would you want to do that anyway? No running around, jumping or squats. I mean, but he's getting around with the cane. And, and it's, it's, he says he's feeling better. He goes, it, it's good. So uh, good, glad to see him come back. Sally Long is still healing from her surgery. Buddy Garvin has his good days and bad days. Mike Coop, you know when he's, uh, he's scheduled? Yeah, he's going to be scheduled next week. Next week for a surgeon. That's on his back, right? Back and neck. Back and neck. Okay. Uh, Eddie Kirby, uh, Jerry Gustamante. Jerry is. Jerry's having a hard time right now. He's in a dark place mentally. In a dark place mentally. Okay, Alex. Daughter. Daughter. Well, I didn't have time to go yet, and he went anyways. And he jumped off because there was a car coming, and he hit his head. Okay. Okay. So one of her friends was riding a bike and saw a car come and jumped off and hit his head. So it's remember remember him. Um, is he all right? He's all right, but he hit his head, and that's always concussions. we got to be careful of that. Um, Don, I got to talk to Don the other day. He's he's having a good a good week. Larry Wood, Larry uh, banged himself up last week. Betty Klippel, Tom, Tom is here. Tom, how you doing? Doing good. Uh, Lenore Owens, Jack Pitts, Jan Terry, uh, Danny Benson, um, so many, so many others. Any more, any others we need to? Rita Garvin said she had surgery Friday. It's coming this Friday, right? Okay. Anyone else? A friend of Eli's was riding his horse, got bucked off, and broke his arm. Okay. Remember him and the little boy that hit his head. Anyone else? David? Deborah. 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 I don't know last name. Okay. She uh, passed out in the nursing home. She passed out in the nursing home. Okay. So we'll remember Deborah. Yeah. Deborah. Okay. We don't know her last name, okay? God knows. He knows. She went to the emergency room. Okay. Anyone else? Let's go to God in prayer.
Father in heaven, we just humbly bow before you and thank you for, for all the many good things that we have and the good things that we can enjoy. And Father, we just humbly bow and say, Father, forgive us. Forgive us for the many times that each and every one of us in our lives, we, we get so caught up in today, in the world and what we're doing that, Father, we leave you out and help us to, to see you every day. Help us to make that a part of our life, Father, that we do include you. We think about you more. We include you in all of our decisions. And Father, we just give thanks and thank you for, for all that we have. Thank you for your word, Father, as we can look at that, that that gives us hope in this world of evil, suffering, and all the pain and things that's going on, Father. We don't have to fear because we know we have a home with you. Lord, we lifted up so many of those that are battling cancer and other physical ailments, and we pray for thy healing hand to be upon them. And Father, uh, Lord, we also pray for wisdom for the doctors, that they do the right things and, and, and do the right procedures. We pray for those that are caring and, and taking care of those, Father, that you will give them that extra amount of comfort and, and strength to continue, Father. And Lord, we pray for those who have lost loved ones, and we know that that's very, very tough and hard to deal with. And Father, but we know, we know that there's hope of a reunion with you forever, but still those need comfort and your peace with them. Father, we pray that this country will, will, will awaken and see you and that people will come to you and, and submit themselves and surrender themselves to you and your word. Father, we just pray that all that we do will bring honor and glory to your kingdom and to your holy name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed to go to class? Okay. Uh, as far as, as what we're doing in this class, um, we got a couple more weeks, but I'd, I'd say about six. And uh, we've, we've get, run a kind of a gamut of all kinds of things. Uh, we got a, a video from, um, from Josh McDowell. And, and then we're going to watch. It's about 15 minutes, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be more of a discussion for us. Um, we've got a chance really to see a lot. But the purpose of the class has never been to, to um, you can take all the notes and if somebody says something, oh, I got this, you know, I know. It was to give you information, let you see, let you find some information. There is so much information out there. And uh, Alex is working on some information. Uh, I, I've learned to go to YouTube. I've never really have done this that much before and see that, that there is so much out there. And uh, it, it's very interesting. You can find it. But that's what we was wanting to do, is to give you that tool that if somebody said something along the way of whatever, it wasn't something that would catch you off guard. It would shake your faith. You would go, I don't know. And they go, aha, see? You know, um, we know that nothing that we say, and, and I do have to apologize again. I said this before, you know, Sunday I went, I went long and I, I wasn't planning on it. But the point of it was, I know there was going to be people there that, that never heard the gospel. I know there was some that never heard the gospel. And I know that there was some that, that go and I just, uh, they got to hear it, you know. So I do apologize for that. I promise I'll never go that long again. But they heard it. So I, you know, and that's what I always got to do. You get one opportunity. To me, I had one opportunity. They had to, you know, and I knew, I knew because they were related to me. So that's why I knew. And uh, so, uh, that, you know, but that's what I'm talking about is that ammunition, that part to be able to see something. Some of you say, well, I'll never talk to anybody about dinosaurs. You may not. Maybe a grandkid. But if somebody says it, you have something. You may never talk about the creation of the earth. No. You might not. You might. And you might have that question. And that's the whole thing is, how did we get here? Was this a, is this just a random act that happened? Or was there a purpose? Was there an intent? Was there a design? And if we believe there's a design, that's how we got here. And we believe our purpose is to serve God. Then what happens when it's over? How do we get off this planet? It's only one way. Through Jesus Christ. That's it. And, it, you know, if, if you look, you can see that. But that's kind of what we were talking about. And it was interesting. We watched a video with Mike Kruger, and I thought he did a great job talking about the, the Gospels. 
what was one of what was one of the number one reasons that he said that would, this is why we have or accept Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? They're the oh, but, but they're they're the ones that were closest closest to that. Alex. Exactly. There's a story in the But but the thing is, they were written probably about 40 years after Jesus had died. They were written in the time of Jesus' life. These people were I, the people who wrote them were eyewitnesses. And the ones who wasn't were with the eyewitnesses or got firsthand information from the eyewitness. That's, that's, that's the biggest thing. And uh, all these others, we, we talked about them and, and we gave some examples and he was able to show us some, some things in them. But it's interesting. It's interesting why we do things like this. And I'm going to let Ryan. Ryan, would you want to share just your story? And that's what it's about. It's about, you know, that who knows? Who knows when that door will be open and somebody asks you the question? And, and you may not know. But say, you know, we talked about that one time. And, and I believe there's something here. Let me get back to you on that. You find it or, or you do what you, and you did great. But you've opened the door for a study. You, you put that you put the truth out there. And, and see, that's the thing is, you know, the, the truth will set you free. Well, they don't want the truth. They want to keep believing the same things and me, 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 my, my, my. So that's the purpose is to give you somewhere you can go find it. We've talked about that. I, I don't remember all of the things, but I do remember us talking about that. And, and I, I'm going to get back with you on that. You know, the, the creation or dinosaurs or whatever it is we've talked about. It gives you that point to say, hey, we've talked about that, and, and I'll get back to you on the truth, but I, well, we can share the truth. You know, we can find out what's going on. It gives you talking points. So why is evidence important for faith? Why do you think that? Anybody can say anything. And here we see, you know, in 2 Second, Second Timothy 1.10, you know, but as you read through that, verse 12, for which cause I suffer also these things, yet I'm not ashamed. For I know him who I have believed. I am persuaded that he is able to guard that which I have committed unto him against that day. We believe in Jesus. We believe that he's coming back. We believe that there's going to be eternal life. And because we believe, we have that hope. That's the hope. But what evidence do we have? So, that's what we've been trying to do is to show evidence, a lot of it outside the Bible. But what evidence is there? You know, and like we said, we've shown, you said we've talked about two or three that are not Christians who wrote regarding that Jesus was on the earth. He was alive. They were reporting facts. So as we look at this and we move on, what is, why is it important to have evidence to back up your belief? And here's my question. What is the biggest question about truth that you find?
people struggling with today. Whether the word of God is really the word of God. Some people struggle with that. What else? What else do you think? Is God even real? Is God even real? You know, and we think about this, and we're going to get into some more things, you know, as we talk about it. But we think about how we were brought up. And, and this is some of the things we're going to talk about after the video. But how much evidence did you have outside of the Bible? What did you know? What did you know? And so much of it is, you know, well, I, my, we, this is where we've always gone. That's what I, I hope that what we've done in this class is to give you that extra little information that you can go and you can prove. Somebody says, well, is God real? There's proof that Jesus Christ was on this earth. And you can take it. If, if you say that Jesus wasn't on the earth, you can't say that Nero or any of those other emperors and all that, they wasn't on the earth. And you can say, well, yeah, but is it true? We have eyewitnesses accounts. Yeah, but they could have lied. Well, there's also the fact that, that when Hannibal crossed the Alps, two people reported it. They reported it differently. Neither one of them had the same story. So did Hannibal cross the Alps? Yeah, but they didn't tell it. You know, so, so the point of it is, you know, we have evidence. We have things there that says Jesus Christ was here. He was on earth. We have it. We have information. Archaeologically, we got so many things that we find. And then that's kind of what we're talking about. We have evidence. We have evidence to back it up. Any other things that are, that are put out there today that you've heard of or, or that you think is a detriment to those Receiving Jesus. Many ways. There's, all, there's, you know, surely, surely with all the ways, Jesus is not the only way. Many ways. Many ways to God. That is one of the biggest questions that I find too with people of truth. There's not many ways. There's one way. What's another one you hear? Adam? I mean, Alex? True for you, but not for me. Yeah. Here's what I believe. Right? Something like that? And they're okay with that. Yeah. What else? That is all encompassing God, and He will forgive me of my sins no matter what. The end of my life. God is an all encompassing God, and He will forgive me of my sins at the end. Regardless. Everybody's going to hell. What else? Yeah. Yeah, you see that, don't you? I mean, people that might not ever even go to church, but where's God? How come God let that happen? Yeah. And we've talked about that. How come pain and suffering? What what else do you think? What other things? Y'all are doing great. There's a lot of these things that's out there, Rob. I believe in a higher power, but I can't believe in the Bible I believe in a higher power, but I can't believe in the Bible because it was written by men. Okay, good. That's out there, isn't it? People fall back on what their parents told them, and that's facts. And I think that that's one of the questions after the video we're going to watch that I'm going to talk about. Did we come up with our faith, or was it our parents' faith? You know, did we surrender or are we just told to surrender, you know? Well, I think they believe in aliens, but they believe in God. They believe in aliens, but they can't believe in God. Any others? Science has proven God doesn't exist. Science has proven God does not exist. 
That's, that's, they think that's true. I got to watch, Alex, I did watch the, the, the debate between uh, Ken Ham and Bill Nye, the science guy. I watched that debate. It's interesting. All you have to do is do good. Do good. And sometimes the good is just don't do bad. And I'll be all right. So there's a lot of them out there. And I hope that we've covered some of these things to give you some information that will help you as we move forward. Okay, we're going to watch this video. This is the guy who wrote this book, Evidence Demands a Verdict. And he's going to talk about his story. But that's the question that finding evidence, finding evidence is if we can get somebody to honestly look at the evidence and all these people, you know, we go to Lee Strobel, you know, and he wrote a case for Christ. Look at the evidence. All these people were trying to disprove the viability of Jesus Christ. And they seen the evidence says he's here. Evidence says he's real. Evidence says he rose from the dead. So, Ryan, let's watch that. Then after that, we're going to talk and, and, and uh, discuss it. No, we need less than one. We're glad that you're here to join us for session five. We're going to less than one. Yep. I've been watching them all a couple of times, so I'm sorry if I did that. But as we think about what he did, he, he, this is his second book. And there's so, I mean, if you want information, there is so much information in that. And uh, you can get it. We got a copy over here. But it, it's amazing. It's amazing to see all the facts. Welcome to the Evidence That Demands a Verdict Bible Study. We're thrilled that you're going to be joining us for these six sessions. We're going to look at some of the biggest, most important questions in life, such as, can we know truth? Did Jesus rise from the grave? Is Jesus really God? And can we trust the Bible as being reliable? Looking forward to going on that journey with you. And before we jump into today's topic, I think it might be helpful if you would kind of frame this series for us by sharing really your journey, your story that led you to kind of question the Christian faith and ultimately become a Christian and write evidence that demands a verdict. We all have a story. Mine started as a young kid in a small town about 1800. Growing up, my father was a town alcoholic. And if you've ever had an alcoholic parent, every day of your life you have shame. And literally when he was trying to kill my mother, I was trying to kill him. And then from six to 13 years of age, for seven years, every single week, once or twice a week, I was homosexually raped by a man by the name of Wayne Bailey. And it just about destroyed everything in my life. And my own parents wouldn't stop it. And so by the time I got to university, I was bitter, I was angry, I was hurt, I was wounded, and I was mad. And when I saw some Christians at the university, their lives were different. So, of course, out of curiosity, I said, come on, what changed your lives? And this young lady just looked me right in the eye and said two words I never thought I'd hear in the university. She just said, Jesus Christ. And I lit into him. I'm sick and tired of that religion, the church, the Bible, Christianity, and Christians. And then I couldn't believe it. They challenged me right there to intellectually, to use my mind, to examine two things, the Bible's being true in the Word of God and Jesus Christ being the Messiah, the Son of God, which I thought was one big joke. But to shut them up, I accepted their challenge. And in the process, I became a believer. And what brought me to Christ was two things. One was the evidence. The evidence showed me that the Bible was true and Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But that didn't bring me to Christ. All that did was get my attention. What brought me to Christ was the love of God. When I saw in the scriptures that, that if I was the only person in the world, Christ still would have died for me. 
So it was actually the love of Christ that brought me to Christ, but it was the evidence that showed me that it was true. So really, in a sense, this series is about learning to love people. It's not about getting into arguments. It's not about getting online and taking something you've heard and proving that as a point is right or wrong. Really what apologetics is, which is this series is about, is kind of clearing away stumbling blocks that people have on their journey to Christ. So really, this is a way of loving people. Now, my, my story obviously would be quite different than your story. I hope be. so. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Growing up in a Christian home, honestly, I never remember the moment where I first became a Christian. I just remember always believing it made sense. In fact, I probably thought people weren't Christians because they just hadn't read Evidence Demands a Verdict. Like, how hard is it? But then when I got to the university, this is the mid-90s, I started reading some blogs that began on kind of the atheist web responding chapter by chapter to evidence that demands a verdict by doctors, lawyers, historians. And it really threw me for a loop. I knew you meant, well, I knew there were good reasons, but for the first time in my life, I remember thinking, gosh, what if Christianity is false? What if this isn't actually true? And I knew I wanted to kind of tell you where I was at questioning this. And we were in Breckenridge, Colorado, went out for some coffee. And I remember we sat down and I just looked you in the eyes. I said, dad, I got to be honest with you. I want to know what's true. I'm just not sure that I'm convinced Christianity is true. I have a lot of questions. And I remember your response was something effective. You said, son, I think that's great. And my next thought was, dad, are you, are you? Even I just said, man, that's <laughs> thrilling, son. That's exciting. And I think that's because, as you would say, you've always taught me to love truth, to follow after truth. And you said, I can't live on your convictions. I've got to find out what is really true and live for it. And ultimately, you're confident I'd be led to the scriptures of the Christian faith because Christianity is true. And you said your mom and I would love you no matter what. I don't think I stopped believing, but that was a real moment where I thought, okay, I've got to know what I think. I've got to examine the evidence and know for myself if I think Christianity is true. So tell me, or, or tell us, why is evidence important for Christians, especially today? Christianity is a historical faith. It's based in history on the resurrection of Christ mainly, and him being the son of God, the Messiah, and dying on the cross for our sins. And one thing that separates Christianity from a lot of faith is it's based upon truth. And truth, you lead to truth through the evidence. And this is what Christ did, what Paul did, and ended up, what I had to do was follow the evidence to the scriptures and to Christ. Today, more than ever, because of the internet, we are exposed to things that even years ago, believers weren't exposed to. And I think it's good. I think it's great to be challenged in our faith. But you know, Sean, it's caused us to have to know even more, not just what we believe, why in the world do we believe it? That's especially important for young people today, because so many are getting challenged in their faith by professors, by online, by friends. And many who don't have good reasons and good evidence find their faith rocked. And then many of them will walk away or they'll lose kind of conviction in their faith. And this kind of brings up a question I think would be helpful to dispel that in the beginning of Evidence Demands Verdict, we walk through 10 of the biggest myths that people have about Christianity. And one of them, one of the biggest ones I hear all the time is about the nature of faith. And oftentimes people add the adjective blind. We assume faith is blind, believing something without evidence, or in many cases, believing something going against the evidence. Now, as I've looked at scripture, one of the things that was really helpful is to notice a pattern you see in the book of Exodus. You also see it in the New Testament. So in the Exodus story, you have God calling Moses in to free the Israelites from captivity. He doesn't show up and just say, hey, follow me. I speak for God. He specifically does miracles, gives the people knowledge that he speaks for God, and then he asks for them to trust him and have faith. So you see with the water turning into blood. You see the frogs coming out. You see the different miracles. It actually says this miracle is done so you will know, and then they're called to faith. So I think the biblical pattern is that God does some kind of miracle or reveals himself, whether it's through our moral conscience, through creation, through some kind of miracle, that gives us knowledge. And then we're called to exercise an intelligent faith. So blind faith is popular in our culture, but it's certainly not what the scriptures teach. But I believe almost every time I hear a Christian say, well, you take Christianity by faith, 
in their mind, they're actually thinking a blind faith. We do take it by faith, but it's an intelligent faith. And like what Sean said, some of the illustrations in scripture, but in the New Testament, uh, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, not ignore it. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And probably one of my favorite is study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. We are commanded to know why we believe what we believe. And that's part of what this series is all about. That's exactly why the scripture says, love God with your heart, with your soul, with your mind, and with your strength. We have nothing to be afraid of as Christians by challenges to the faith. In fact, what you taught me is we should welcome them because ultimately we are committed to truth. And if Christianity were not true, we shouldn't believe it. But as you discovered and I discovered, and we're going to walk through in the series, there is good reason to believe that Christianity is true. Well, every, t every time somebody challenges me, and I might not have the answer. I know you're amazed with that, but I might not have the answer. But, you know, I grow through that because I do my homework. I go out. I study. I research. I find the answer. And every time I grow in my faith. So I look forward to people challenging. That's why I always look forward to debates. I've done 250 debates because I love to be challenged in my faith. That's part of our hope for this series is that when you start to examine and understand the evidence is there's a confidence that comes with this. Now, part of what we're doing in this series is what the church has historically called apologetics. And it has nothing to do with apologizing or saying that you're sorry. Apologetics, the word actually comes from 1 Peter 3.15, where it says, Set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. Always be ready with an answer for the hope within. Give it with gentleness and with respect. And the word answer or reason in the original Greek is apologia, apologetics. So is it apologetics what all Christians are called to, to be ready with an answer for the hope that we have in God and the scriptures and the Christian story? Apologetics put simple as this. Somebody asks you, why do you believe? The answer that you give them is apologetics. It's set forth positive reasons why you believe. Somebody asks you, well, do you really believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God? Your answer is apologetics. And as the Bible says, we need to be ready all the time to give an answer for the hope that is in us, the hope about the Bible, about Christ, about the resurrection. And this is what evidence that demands a verdict can really help you do. This brings us to an interesting point, because so many times people think that apologetics is this recent phenomena in the church. Now, I do think that we're in a golden age where there's more powerful arguments than there's been. But I really think Jesus was the first apologist. If you look in John chapter but he had some five, pretty powerful arguments. Well, he did. Now, he didn't just do arguments. He obviously healed people. He told stories. He built relationships. He asked questions. But he also reasoned with people. John chapters 5 through 8, we see Jesus pointing to the Father, pointing to the testimony of Scripture, the testimony of Moses fulfilled prophecies. One of the things that he did is give evidences. We also see the same thing with Paul. It says that Paul would go and reason uh, with people from the scriptures, such as on Mars Hill. We see it throughout the rest of the New Testament. And in fact, some of the first church fathers into the second century were called apologists because they put forth a case defending Christianity. So really apologetics is nothing new, is it? No, every generation has had its great apologists, people who God has raised up to help provide the answers and to instruct the church. And it's nothing new, hmm. except I think, as Sean said, it's much more profound today, a lot of it because of the Internet. You see, 15, 20 years ago, the great intellects didn't have access to your children, uh, except maybe in the last couple of years at the university, or if they write a book, a few people would read it. Today, they have almost the same access to our children as you and I have. And as a result, because it's just one click away, some of the most profound arguments. That's why it's so necessary today to help every single believer to come to know not just what you believe, but why in the world do you believe it? That's the key question for today. Now, you set out on your journey to disprove Christianity really in the 50s. And you traveled around the world. You went to libraries to gather all the evidence you could against it. Ended up becoming a believer and then you wrote Evidence Demands a Verdict really in kind of the early 70s. How would you compare the evidence now with when you first started your journey 
and when you first wrote evidence. Oh, now there's such an abundance of evidence. Just for example, in the scriptures, uh, I was with one of the, probably one of the top three Greek scholars in the world and New Testament scholars. And he made this comment to me. He said, Josh, in the last 10 to 15 years, we've had an absolute tsunami of evidence on the reliability of the scriptures. As the internet has brought more challenges to the faith at the same time, it's brought a greater awareness of the incredible amount of historical evidence for the faith. So I rejoice in both being confronted with the faith and discovering the evidence for it. So what's your hope for this series that people would get out of walking through these six sessions with us exploring some of the evidence? I would think one, they'll come to realize there is evidence that Christianity is based on truth. There is evidence. And I pray out of this series, you can't get a lot out of a series like this, but it will motivate you and put something in your life that says, I want to study further. I want to know further why I believe. And this is where I think books like Evidence That Demands a Verdict can be such a help because it's all documented. Well, I'm looking forward to exploring this evidence with you and unpacking it with you as well. Thanks for tuning in and joining us in this first session. In the next few, we're going to start to look at the questions. Is there such a thing as truth? Can we trust the scriptures? Did Jesus rise from the grave? We'll see you soon. Okay, as we think about that, and as we think about evidence, why do you believe? Why? Common sense. Common sense? I think about the prophecies that come true. The prophecies. Okay. If somebody asks you, why do you believe? What what do you say? <clears throat> you believe in the word that is written and it that it's God inspired. Why do you believe? Why do you believe what you believe? Intelligent design. Intelligent design. You believe there's got to be some type of intelligent design for all this. I believe what I believe because the opposite of it is not worth believing. The opposite, you believe what you believe because the opposite is not worth believing. Okay? Okay. Think about that. Somebody asks you, why do you believe? What, what's your answer? Why do you believe? Why, why do you come? Why, do, why are you here? Bill? Because of creation. Because of creation? Okay. That's what we're talking about. And we think about this and we're looking at it. Where is your faith? Why are we where are we at? And um, how did how were you brought up? Were you told what to believe? Were you told? Did you? Had to find out for yourself. How'd you do that? Reading the Bible. Reading the Bible. Okay. Good. Good. Was faith that you had your faith, or was it the faith of your parents? David? Of yourself? First it was the parents. I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't. I had my parents' faith. We went somewhere else. And it wasn't until I studied the scripture. Somebody, somebody, my wife was the biggest one. I had to look. I had to see. And it was contrary to what I've been told. I found evidence. Something has to point us in that direction. Something has to do it. And, you know, that's the thing is, do we investigate? You know, as we talk to somebody, do we investigate what's real, what's true? John Clay put out a series, Does God Exist? He started out, he and Madeline Mary O'Hare started out to prove. Here, they're not going to hear you in the back. John Clay and, my, and Madam uh, Marilyn, Madam, yeah, that lady, Marilyn Madeline O'Hare, started out trying. They were the biggest atheists around. They tried to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt 
that the Bible was false. He did everything he could, and by his studying, he said, all I can prove now is the Bible is true. He puts out a series every month uh, called Does God Exist? And it is very helpful for anybody. But he went out to prove it was wrong, and everybody who tries to prove it wrong ends up proving more that it's right. And I think it's John Clayton. Clayton, Clayton yeah, because we're gonna we're gonna have one one session over him. We're gonna talk about probabilities because we talk about intelligent design, you know, and, and the probabilities. What are the chances of all this just happening? We're gonna get to that, and I'm gonna use this book. But that's what I wanted to spark tonight was that thought about evidence. We need evidence in our lives. We need to look for ourselves. We need to see this is why I believe. This is why I believe. I believe that the Bible is true. Why? Because somebody said it was? No, because the evidence behind it, there is not another piece of any type of, any, any type of literature that has more, more backing, things written, written closer to when it happened, pieces of, of parchment, pieces of documentation in any other book, than any other book. I believe by archaeology, Things that they say in the Bible, they're there. They're true. We have written, we have written word from other people, non-Christians, that identify Jesus Christ. Jesus was here. He was executed by Pontius Pilate. Evidence. I believe because I believe that word is true. And I believe we have the things here now to see and to back that up. That's what each and every one of us has got to have. That evidence, that, that. Why do you believe? Well, I believe because my wife, like I come with her. Or I believe because this. I believe because, you know, my friends, my mom and dad told me. You got to have your faith. And you got to have your, you got to know why you believe. And that's kind of what we're going to wrap up. All of this, we've been going 10 weeks. We're going to do a few more and, and get to that. But that's what we're talking about. I, I need you to talk. I need you to share. And we're going to talk about, we're going to get into, was Jesus real? We're going to get into, was he really crucified? You know, and we're going to talk about those things. But all of this, all of this, just like he said, is to prompt further study. All of it. You look, you find it, you open, you know, you open these things. And like I said, I got to watch, I'll, I'll end it with this. I did watch that. Uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, and I got to watch uh, Ken Ham. And, and some of the biggest deals that... Uh, that Bill Nye will show me the evidence. Well, and what he was looking for, you know, well, how come there's layers and, and it couldn't have been, it had to be millions of layers. And Ken Ham goes, we wasn't there. Things could have caused a change and he didn't want to believe, but you know, there, it's not going to sit there and spell it out. You know, you have to have that faith to say, yeah, we wasn't there. We wasn't there when all these things happened and things happen now differently than they happened back then. So, part of it we have to take on faith. And uh, it just strengthened my faith. It strengthened my faith to look at it. Toby? I just read an article last week where an archaeologist came up with found evidence of the wheel of the chariot at the bottom of the Red Sea. It just fell off a boat, didn't it? Yeah. You know, I, Randy's teaching an axe. And, and, and it, like I said, in this book, there's so much. And in the book, they were really, the, the critics blasted Luke because Luke was very thorough in what he did. And he wrote some things that didn't match up to what they believed. And I told Randy, I was going to give him, a, there's about 10 different things that archaeology now have found that said it was exactly right. Back then, it wasn't called that. And I think one of them was that, that he called him a governor and he wasn't the governor. And they said, oh, Luke is wrong. And, but when it come back, if he was a proconsul and something else, that was equal to the governor. And they found some inscription on something. Archaeology proved it. And there was a, there were so many of those. But there's so much evidence. We got to look for it. And we shouldn't have blind faith because our parents have faith. We need to have our own faith. So that's what this is all about. Any comments before we close? Alex. Coliseum with his name on it. It also sounds like a little soldier's with his with his name on it. I mean, it's 
God's blood. I mean, it, it is, it, it's there. There's actually a, I think it's called the Archaeology Study Bible, <laughs> just a specific resource if you want something, you know, along that line. But You're right, it's there. I mean, if you want to look for it, Dean? You know, like, I got hit on something. When we were going up back in our cage, the internet stuff wasn't there, so we didn't get hammered about on Facebook. You know, everybody believed. Everybody went to church. And stuff. But still, our kids that go to college? Yeah. Now, they're, you know, your iPhone. I mean, you get all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and it comes up. But, but that's the deal. Our kids, we lose a lot of kids. We lose a lot of kids that go to school, and that's what they're being bombarded with. Professors say, well, that's not true. That does, and, you know, and in some of these things that I've read, they take great pride at the beginning. How many are Christians? We'll see how many you are at the end of the semester. They take, they take great pride in turning them away from God. That's what's out there. Yep. I did think, though, Mike? That's what a lot of them use. We're gonna have we'll close with prayer, but one thing I did, I did think he had really good looking clothes back in the 70s. I I, I really he had some good looking clothes back then. Randy Walters used to wear them all the time. <laughs> Alex? If you want to, you can see Alex afterwards. He he got those two. He can get it. David? Uh, you mentioned the School of Hope earlier, Honduras. Why do you suppose that they seem to accept the gospel as is quicker than we do here? Well, Craig's been, Randy's been, Nancy, why? Why do you think? For a lot of these reasons we're talking about. And they don't have all this delusion. They're not all on the internet like we are over there. They don't have that access that we have. So they're not inundated with all this craziness out there. It's a lot more simple for them. And they're always using it. What's amazing is you go over there and you, and you show them the gospel and you go through it and you say, you know, Peter says, you know, repent and be baptized and wash away your sins. And you do all that. And when you get finished, Let's go. Let's get baptized. Well, do you want? No, let's go now. That they see, they sense the need and the urge to go get it done right now. And we get here in America, and they go, "Well, no, I, you know, you can pray the prayer that's not even in the Bible, or you can do this." And they they try to, you know, it's really it's amazing. It's amazing. Mike, sounds like in Honduras the way it is now, the way Dean explained when he was a child. When it was that way here, and then we got too big for our own britches, uh, and that, that's going to be our fall. 
as one of many reasons this country is not going to make it very long. We're too big. We, we, ain't, we ain't nothing. We got too much stuff. We ain't nothing. And you think about it, they say that the attention span is like eight seconds or 22 seconds because they're always looking at the phone. And you think about it, the people who look at a phone have to look at it within every 22 seconds. Our attention span is not very long. You sit over there and you sit outside and there's nothing. And you get to sense the peace and sense all of that. So we have too much stuff. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for, Father, us to see that there is evidence of you. There's evidence of you all around us. And Father, all we got to do is open our eyes and look. Help each other, one of us to confirm our faith by, by what we believe and why we believe it. And that we can be bold to share that and be ready to answer that question when somebody asks, why do you believe? Father, we thank you. Thank you again for the blessings that you've put upon us. Father, we just are so humbled that you cared that much for us, was able to send your son to die for us, even while we were sinners, Father. Thank you so much. And we give honor and glory to your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your comments. Very good.